Hello and welcome to this third installment in the novel Scientific Developments from War series. This time we are going to look at the effect of colonialism, public health and medicine. As it is, colonialism gets a bad rap with it being blamed for all of the world's woes. While there are some problems that can only be squarely laid at the feet of these imperial powers, like the Pakistan-India politics, the religious divide of Israel, and more, others are simply lumped in with this. That egregiously oversimplifies the problems and ignores many of the benefits brought by this. The thing is that many of these same terrible powers brought with them technology, practices, and ideas that greatly improved the health, medicine, and sanitation of the colonies. These were solutions to problems that had been solved in colonists' home country long before, the same problems that we are now seeing resurge in places like Africa and could be reduced, but not necessarily removed, by using some of these old ideas. The greatest empire for colonialism was Britain, which at one point controlled about a quarter of the world's population. They achieved this through military conquest for the most part. This could be the conquest and subjugation of India, through to the diplomatic capitulation of China leading to Hong Kong. This was achieved through Britain's army and navy, who provide a good example of the benefits war has brought to a wider world and population. The British military was a professional standing army. This meant training, regulations and structure. Like the Roman Empire's forts and roads left an impression across Europe and Asia Minor, the British Army and Navy left an imprint across the world. These were largely focused on sanitation, health and nutrition. Let's begin with latrines. A latrine is a form of field toilet. It is full of feces after a short time of use and this becomes a breeding ground for bacteria. Bacteria lead to infection and disease. This led to a huge problem for many armies over the years, with the Mexican War of 1848 exemplifying this. For every man to die during this war from combat, up to seven more died from diarrhea. This was a lesson the Americans failed to take from Crimea, but the British did not. This is why large standing armies with structures, routine, and regulation had rules about latrines. This began as early as the 18th century and is exemplified by the Duke of Marlborough, who is said to have issued regulations that required the following. Latrines were to be separate from the main part of the camp. The removal of animal waste and dead animals. That latrines were to be moved regularly. That soldiers were to be punished for disposing of themselves anywhere but the latrine. Prior to these regulations, relieving oneself was a matter of subjectivity, urgency and convenience. The facilities were less structured, and it led to problems that is best demonstrated by British India. While in India, the military force was often billeted with local natives, and this meant they were sharing facilities. This included both the local levies and the imperial forces. The latrines were not built to military regulation standards, and as such, it led to the contamination of the water table and waterways. These were the primary water source, either via directly drawing water from rivers, or by wells that tapped the water table that after the latrines were built poorly became contaminated with bacteria. 
the sanitary work in British India began when the Royal Commission of 1859 began. They issued a report in 1863 on the conditions of the army and the mortality rate. This was something to the effect of 69 deaths per 1,000 soldiers. They recommended the establishment of a commission of public health for each region and they made clear there was a need to improve sanitation and that this would help in prevention of epidemics both in civil society and in the military. This led to an act in 1864 which created the Sanitary Police Force. This was under the charge of military medical officers and was intended to improve military hygiene. This was then extended to the civilian population by the creation of sanitary boards in each province in 1864. This included a sanitary inspector general who later became the sanitary commissioners. They took over all of the roles in 1870 and it was merged with departments responsible for vaccinations. In 1817 you have the British East India Company who first encountered cholera. This was in Bengal and from 1870 to 1821 there were a number of epidemics that sent shockwaves throughout the military. By the 1830s cholera was known as a life-threatening disease and in India where it first showed itself there was a pressure to present and provide medical services as it could in effect destroy an army in days and weeks. As there was no treatment in the 19th century for cholera, the military focused on prevention. This further pushed the need for sanitation and particularly control and proper construction of both latrines and sewage systems of some description. This is similar to how many other countries began to gain a sanitary system that was similar to that of the Western world. Along with this military effort and the consequential impact, the army brought with it medical staff. In many of the colonies, this was a vastly different approach to health that relied less on ritual, customs or culture and was instead based on experimentation, research and evidence. Not all of these practices were sound, with some of the worst examples being bloodletting and leeches. The first hospitals in India were the Madras General Hospital in 1679. This built on the East India Company's earlier visiting surgeons and doctors. In 1757, the East India Company established itself properly with an ongoing permanent stable presence. They brought with them military and civil services, which included medical staff. In 1764, it was expanded with the establishment of a dedicated facility that had 12 surgeons and 28 assistant staff. Twenty years later, this led to a formal board of medical staff who were distributed in places like Bengal. In 1869, a public health commissioner and statistical officer were appointed to the government of India. This comes from the stunning number of deaths between 1817 and 1860, which exceeded 15 million. In the roughly 40 years that followed that, another 23 million died. Along with that, there was the third pandemic of plague which occurred in the mid-19th century, and this spread to all of the continents, killing 10 million people in India. This led to the development of microbial identification and deployment of vaccines. By 1925, India had its own plague laboratory. 
the expansion into India led to exposure to diseases that were unknown in Britain. This included malaria, and in 1898, Sir Ronald Ross proved that malaria was transmitted via mosquitoes. This is why when the British Empire came into India and these new diseases were endemic to a region they were not familiar with, they were in a lot of trouble. India is a large place with many variable environments and this means that it has many variable diseases. As strange as it may seem, the efforts to preserve the fighting strength of initially the East India Company and later British Imperial forces helped in the long term in trying to sustain civilian life. Things like sanitation that removed waste material as far away from the population as possible meant that not only soldiers were kept safe but the civilian population was. Exploration of diseases such as leprosy, cholera and malaria had carry on effects to the civilian population where knowledge of how to prevent its spread could then be used by civilian and military forces. To be forthright about it, the spread of malaria was at least somewhat facilitated by colonialism. The establishment of railways and irrigation networks by the British Indian government allowed for the spread of malaria carrying mosquitoes. They were not designed with the seasonal nature of India in mind, where there would be annual flooding that would overcome these systems and lead to large bodies of fresh water that were breeding grounds for mosquitoes. This led to large death tolls, economic loss, and danger to the British Imperial forces. By 1840, this became such a problem that both drainage was improved and chemoprophylaxis was started in the form of quinine. Going now from the land-based colonization to the benefits and strengths of the British Imperial Navy. It was well known that sailors were liable to develop scurvy and many nations had their own approach to solve this. Britain relied heavily on the work of a surgeon by the name of James Lynn. He had 12 men from a ship. Each of them had scurvy. He had them put into pairs and gave each group different additions to their diet. He found that citrus fruit, such as lemons, all limes and oranges, are able to reduce the incidence and ideally treat scurvy. This was later expanded upon by a physician by the name of Gilbert Blaine, who pushed the Admiralty to issue citrus juice as a daily ration to the British Navy. This effectively allowed the British Navy to operate further from shore for longer and with a healthier crew. These advancements were of huge benefit for many years, decades, and arguably centuries after they were discovered. Consider how we use vitamin C now to prevent scurvy. Malaria is an ongoing threat that is best controlled by reducing the mosquito population and exposure to them. These and other developments are important. These developments also occurred at costs, not touched on here, but are detailed in the linked sources. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions below.